A wonderful morning, my uh, dear brethren, and those who are in our Zoom, good morning. So this morning, we will uh, be talking about the vine and the vine dresser. Just like what uh, was read a while ago in uh, our scripture reading in John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now, John chapter 15 is part of what was commonly known, what is commonly known as the uh, Last Supper discourse or the Upper Room discourse. It started in uh, John chapter 13 and uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And this is where Jesus spent his time with his 12 uh, apostles during uh, uh, this evening. Now, he was with the apostles teaching them, preparing them, at the same time comforting them because his death is nearing. Now in John chapter 15, it opens up with a powerful declaration of Jesus. When Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Number one, Jesus said, I am. I am. I am means it is a powerful declaration of self-identity. Jesus immediately told his disciples, I am. Therefore, denoting and declaring himself, his identity to his disciples as having all power. In John chapter 1 verse 3, all things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, <clears throat> not even one thing was made that has come into being. So Jesus Christ declared immediately that I am all powerful. And then Jesus' de uh, declaration of I am, it means having all authority. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, we read, And you are complete in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So Jesus declared his identity. Now second, when Jesus said I am, it is a claim of deity. A claim of deity. First of all, only a true God can claim this. Nobody in his right mind can claim that he is God and that he is the I am. Only God can claim such a name. And in the history of the Bible, no one claims this except God. And we can read that in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So Jesus was declaring his deity when he said to his disciples that I am. Jesus said, I am, it means he is God. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Unfortunately, many until today, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They believe that he is just a man, or they believe that Jesus Christ is only a prophet, that there is only one God, which is God the Father. Or they believe that Jesus Christ is God, He is the Son, He is the Father, and He is the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus said to His disciples, I am, He is God. And John 1.1 1, 1 declares to us that Jesus Christ is indeed God. So when Jesus said, I am, the next statement or words that He uttered, the truth. I am the true vine. He is the truth. <clears throat> Are you familiar? Probably you're familiar with these lines. This is a, uh, a courtroom scene. When Coffee said, Colonel Joseph, did you order the code red? And the judge said, you don't have to answer that question. Colonel Joseph I'll answer the question. You want answers? Kathy, I think I'm entitled. Joseph, you want answers? Kathy, I want the truth. Now, Colonel Joseph said, you can't handle the truth. 
Now, probably those statements are familiar with you. Those were the lines from a few good men. Jack Nicholson, the judge, I forgot his name, and my look-alike. <laughs> Tom Cruise, huh? <laughs> now, Colonel Joseph, or um, what's his name again? Jack Nicholson, you can handle the truth. And uh, Tom Cruise said, I want the truth. The problem we have today, my dear brethren and friends, it, it is not the question of what is the truth. That is not our problem, or if we want the truth. The real challenge is, are we willing to accept the answer as the truth? That is the real challenge. Many people are asking, not because they want to hear the truth, but because they want to hear what they want to hear. So the challenge for us today is not really if we want to know the truth, but are you willing to accept the answer as the truth? Now, in John chapter 18, verse 38, <clears throat> just right after the Last Supper discourse, Jesus was in front of Pilate. Now, look what Pilate asked Jesus Christ. What is truth? Or what is the truth? Retorted Pilate. Now with this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now Pilate, he was asking Jesus this question after Jesus' declaration of his kingdom. If you will read John chapter 18. Now maybe Pilate was still in shock. Then he said to Jesus Christ, if you have a kingdom, then you are a king. Then Jesus said to Pilate, you said it yourself. You said it yourself. Now, now comes verse 18, uh, verse 38, where Pilate asked, what is the truth? Now, my question when, when, when I was reading this, was Pilate really asking to know the truth, or was his question a kind of rhetoric? Was he ready to accept whatever the truth that Jesus would reveal to him? Or would he, like be many of us, who hide in the narrative of, you have the truth, I have my own truth. Most people, we hide in this narrative. You have your own interpretations, I have my own interpretations. You have your own belief, I have my own belief. And with that, we don't want to hear the truth. What we want is what we want to hear. You see, that is our problem. We seek the truth, and yet when confronted with the truth, we don't want to accept it because it goes, number one, it goes against our so-called truth. Now, this is not what we want to hear. Now, Pilate, he was asking for the truth. Yet, the problem with him, he was asking for the truth, but the truth is actually right there in front of him, Jesus Christ. And yet he was not willing to listen and to accept the truth. What is truth? According to dictionary.com, truth is a verified or indisputable fact, principle, proposition, or the like. Now, the definition, if you would look at it, it used the word verified. Verified, past tense, meaning the truth was checked, the truth was confirmed for reality or accuracy. Then we have the word indisputable, which means cannot be denied nor doubted. Now this kind of truth is what we call the absolute truth. And they say that there are two types of truth, the absolute and the relative truth. Now what is absolute truth? Absolute truth is true regardless of how a person perceives it or feels about it. It doesn't change. That is absolute truth. For example, a triangle has three sides. It cannot have four sides. That's absolute. You cannot call a triangle with four sides. One plus one equals two. 
That's absolute. One plus one can never be four. One plus one equals two is absolute. Now, the other type of truth is relative truth. It changes depending on the person's perceptions, preferences, or feelings. For example, Joe said Honda is the best car brand, but Jerry said Ford is. That is relative. You see, one can be right, but not both of them can be right. It's either one of them is right and one of them is wrong. Not both of them can be right, right? So that's relative truth. Now, their truth is a matter of personal preferences, okay? Pre uh, personal choice, relative truth. But I will not discuss further the differences between absolute or relative truth. Now, when Jesus told his disciples that he is the true vine, the truth, he is the absolute truth for salvation. That's number one. Acts 4.12 tells us salvation exists in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's absolute, absolute truth. No other names. I cannot save you. Nobody here can save you. Only Jesus Christ can save us. That's absolute. And his word is the absolute standard of righteousness. Okay. His word is the, the standard of righteousness. Now, whenever Jesus utters the word, but I say unto you, especially in, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, okay, he was telling us that his words, I say unto you, it is imperative, I say unto you, meaning his words is the standard for which we must live, the standard for righteousness. Now, Jesus is the truth. He never lies. He never lies. And by the truth of his word, we are sanctified, according to James chapter 17, verse 17. Now, James chapter 17, verse 17, and the words of Jesus Christ being the true vine, being the truth, is very much important because, again, Jesus is the truth, his word, According to John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth because thy word, your word, is truth. Meaning we pattern our life, our moral standard, our standard of righteousness based upon the word of Jesus Christ. Based upon the principles he laid down in the Bible. Based upon whatever you're reading and what you're, you're holding right now, the Bible. And that is the basis for our morality. And when Jesus said, I am the true, meaning you pattern your life to me. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, tells us how we are sanctified. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, let me just go and discuss a bit about the word sanctification. Sanctification is three, three, threefold, <laughs> threefold. Number one, there is separation. Sanctification, it is the act of God's grace by which we are now alienated from sin, meaning we are separated from sin and the world. Before, we are together with the world, like this. But since we are sanctified, the act of God's grace by, by which we are now alienated, we are now separated. So sanctification is threefold. Number one is separation. There is a separation of us from the world, of us from the sins. And being set aside, separated for a sacred purpose. Not that we are alienated, only alienated from sin and the world, we are also separated. We are set aside for a special purpose. Sanctification, separation. We are separated. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. With those words, we can learn that we are truly separated by God for a special or a sacred 
purpose. That's why you are sanctified. You are separated to proclaim the virtues on, of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is one of our purpose why God separated us to proclaim his marvelous light to everybody. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Amen. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Number two, the second fold of sanctification is dedication. Since we are set aside for a sacred purpose, our lives are dedicated to the service of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You are separated for a special purpose. So when you are sanctified, it means your life is now dedicated for the work of God. Your life is now dedicated to the service of God, to meet the master's use, whatever that is. You are to meet the master's use and prepare unto every good work. You would be a vessel to deliver the gospel of salvation towards everybody who are still living in the darkness until right now. Just like what Apostle Paul, what happened to Apostle Paul when Jesus met him. Jesus told Apostle Paul, you shall be a vessel unto me. You will be a vessel to bring the message of salvation to everybody. That's why he was called the apostle to the Gentiles because he opened up the door, the gospel to the Gentiles. So you, we are as well a vessel of God because in us is the gospel message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The number three, sanctification threefold number three is spirit filled. Sanctification is to make us holy. We live a life of holiness that can only be achieved through spirit-filled living. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, Now I say, walk by the Spirit, and you should not gratify the desires of the flesh. When you are sanctified, you are now walking with the Spirit, and that means you are now not gratifying, not gratifying the desires of the flesh, but you are to meet whatever God will use you to meet the master's use. Again, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Now, when Jesus tells us that he is the truth, then there is no other. His declaration of I am the true absolute. When Jesus gave the gospel message of salvation, there is no other way but his way. Absolute. When Jesus said he is the life, then all other leads to death. Absolute. Now Jesus showed us this absolute truth at work when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Now if we would analyze the temptation, the event, Jesus proved that he is God. He proved that he is God and Satan is not. He proved that he is the truth and Satan only deceives. So therefore, he proved that he is the absolute truth. Third, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Divine. Divine. Now, let's look at the picture here of when Jesus tells the disciples, I am the true vine, he was referring to a grapevine because that was a dominant in that time. So this is an example of a grapevine. Now, the branches, according to John 15, are those things, those that stems out 
of what they call the trunk. Those are the branches that was referred to or that are referred to in John chapter 15. Now, the vine is actually that part or what they normally call the trunk, but it is actually called the vine, the central vine. Okay. So Jesus is the main vine. And all of us, according to John chapter 15, we are the branches. Okay. So that was the illustration for, just for us to have a, a, a kind of view of what was Jesus telling his disciples when he said that I am the true vine. When Jesus said I am the true vine, he was identifying himself as the central part of a grape vine, the trunk, the vine, the vine that holds everything. Now, a definition of a vine is a plant whose stem requires support and which climbs tendrils or twinning or creeps along the ground or wall. The trunk or the main vine gives its support and holds everything and sends nutrients from the root to all its branches to help it nourish and bear fruit. Now, let's look at verse 2 for a while of John chapter 15. In John chapter 15 verse 2, it says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now at first look or at first glance at this verse, it seems like the branches are mainly responsible in bearing the fruits. But looking at the definition a while ago and the anatomy of the grapevine, our example earlier, it is really the main, the main vine or the trunk that sustains the branches to bear fruits. It is not merely the branches that bear fruits. It comes from the stem or it comes from the main vine, the trunk, that produces the branches, their fruits. Now, knowing this, we can appreciate more the meaning of Jesus when he said, I am the true vine. Because he is the source of life. He is the trunk. He is the main vine. Jesus was telling his disciples that I am the source of life. I am the source of your life. Remember that Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, he was nearing his death. And he knows that his disciples were all worried. And he knows that he needed to comfort them. So, to give them comfort, he gave them these words. Because Jesus eventually knew that they would lose their lives for him. And they will have a true life in heaven. That's why Jesus said, I am the true vine. He was like saying to them, even if you lose your life, you will find your life because I am the source of life. In John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, adheres to or trusts in, relies on, will live even if he dies. So that's what Jesus was telling his disciples. I am the source of life. I am the true vine. Jesus was preparing his disciples for what was to come ahead of them. He was kind of reinforcing to them of who he is. And Jesus doesn't want his disciples to fall away when, they, when he would left them. He doesn't want his disciples to be discouraged when he is gone. Now as Jesus himself will be resurrected, so also they too can be resurrected and will be resurrected. And also all of us who remain faithful till the end will be resurrected because Jesus said, I am the vine. I am the source of life. Now in one of 
the, I think, most profound statement of Peter when Jesus asked them if they would abandon him, just like his other disciples abandoned him. Peter answered in John 6, 68, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are divine. You are the source of life. Where could I go? But to the Lord, as the song goes. You see, Jesus is the very source of our life. Indeed, to whom shall we go? Now, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Number four, the father is the gardener or the vine dresser. Now, what is vine dresser? According to the dictionary, a specialist who oversees the vineyard and prunes, trains, and cultivates vines. Now, we can see the relationship between Jesus and God the Father in the words of Jesus when he said, I am the true vine and the Father is the vine dresser. The Father is in charge of the vineyard. He oversees the vineyard. He tends to it, he cares to it, and gets rid of those that are not producing any fruits. And he prunes them so that those who bear fruits, they can bear even more fruits. They can be even more fruitful. That the branches need only the vine, but it also needs the vine dresser. So it needs both. It needs the vine and it needs the father being the vine dresser who trims and who prunes the vineyard. In John chapter 2, verse 23, because there is an interconnection between the son and the father and us in our salvation. John, first John chapter 2, 23 Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. It means you cannot believe the Son and not believe in the Father or vice versa. You cannot believe the Son and not believe the Father, or you cannot believe the Father and not believe the Son. You must believe in both, and you must have both. <clears throat> now, the point is this, that we must be mindful of the Father as well. And Jesus pointed out that he is life. He also pointed out that the Father is also life in John chapter 17, verse 3. When Jesus said, now this is what? Eternal life. And what is eternal life? That they may know you, pointing to the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So you must need the Father and the Son, and of course, includes the Holy Spirit. So we now see the connection of the vine and the vine dresser who oversees the vineyard concerning the bearing of fruits of the branches. So we need to have both in our lives. Now, what are the functions of the vine dresser? There are actually two main functions of the vine dresser according to John chapter 15. Number one, it cuts off the branch that bears no fruit. So it's the vine dresser who cuts off the branch. Okay. Now, ultimately, in the judgment day, again, ultimately in the judgment day, those who fall away, who were once in Jesus, that bears no fruit, will finally be cut off and thrown away in the lake of fire. Revelation 21 Verse 8. Now second, according to John 15, verse 2, the second function of the vine dresser is that he prunes. He prunes. Now according to dictionary, pruning, it is trimmed by cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems, especially to increase fruitfulness and growth. So by general definition, this is the definition of pruning. So, Pruning is actually cutting off. It is cutting off as well. Removal 
Now, if you will come to think of it, it is somehow counterintuitive at first. Because the divine dresser is also cutting away. Somehow it's counterintuitive. But the truth is, it is very much better for the branches as it will have more healthy leaves and it will yield more fruits. If you are in, 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 the, in the know of plants and trees, you would know that pruning is very much essential. Now, what is Jesus teaching us or teaching his disciples and teaching us today when he said that the Father is the vine dresser? Number one is that pruning will give us pain. It is, it is not comfortable when you are being cut, being trimmed, being removed. It's not comfortable. It's painful. So pruning will give us pain. In John chapter 16, 33, I have told you this thing so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage. But take courage. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Now, I want you to look very carefully at the words of Jesus when he said, these things. These things, including John chapter 15. Again, as I've told you earlier, that from, from John, chapter, John chapter 13 to John chapter 17, it is a discourse by Jesus Christ when he was with the apostles in the upper room during the Last Supper. Now, when Jesus said in John chapter 16, these things, including what he was telling his disciples in John chapter 15 that you will be pruned, that in pruning you will have pain. It is necessary. Trials will be necessary. Tribulations will be necessary. And it is part of every life, not only Christian life. Everybody experienced this. Now in the process, Jesus assured us. Jesus assured his disciples when he said, I have overcome the world. So pruning will give us pain. Pruning keep us healthy for eternity. Now it is no doubt that pruning is necessary. It is imperative to keep any tree and to keep any plants healthy. Now with a little trim over here like this, little trim right here, right there, there, there. It's necessary for this particular plant. Oh, not this particular plant. It is necessary for a plant, for a tree, to be pruned. Because it will be healthier. It will be livelier, so to speak. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, For whom the Lord loved, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, never think, never think that pruning is punishment. Never think that way. That pruning is punishment, but according to the word of God, it is love from God. It is love from the master. So we must endure it because God wants you to be ready for eternity. Acts 14, 22. They encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer we must endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. So pruning keeps us healthy for eternity. Now, brethren and friends, Jesus said, I am the true vine. He is the absolute source of all truth. He is the vine. He is the source of your life. The Father is the vine dresser. We also need we also need and heed to the father because he takes care of us and pruning is very much part of our life because god wants us to be ready in eternity so my dear brethren and friends the gospel is yours may you find comfort and may you find encouragement in the lesson today as we continue in our journey in this world and it is my prayer that those who have not yet accepted the Lord that are here the biblical way, that you will take time to really think of 
you know, how much you really love yourself in the light of how much God really loves you and that he sent, he sent his, his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Now, it is also my prayer that you would take the step of love towards eternity by coming forward and accepting Jesus, repenting of your sins, and being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning and God bless us all.